Hello, and welcome to episode 85 of On Liberty, coming to you live from the Center for Independent Studies in Sydney, Australia. I'm your host, Salvatore Babonis, and joining me today is James Allen, the Garrick Professor in Law at the University of Queensland and a weekly columnist for Spectator Australia. We'll be asking James about the meaning of hate speech, the U.S. Supreme Court, and the definition of woman. <laughs> Professor James Allen, how are you? Thank you very much, Salvatore. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, too. Look, in your latest uh, Spectator column, you write that hate is, quote, one of the few remaining first principles that virtually all of us sort of accept, which is why so many activists, quote, throw around the charge of hate with gay abandon. What do you mean we all accept hate? I thought we're all opposed to hate. Well, what I meant was that hate is a uh, shared currency. So we all agree that you ought not to be hateful. Uh, all the other sort of shared moral background that we used to have, Christian ethos or even the sort of classical liberal views or the old fashioned notion of tolerance, or even the idea of, uh, uh, you know, leaving other people alone or that we didn't demand that we be respected, that's all gone out the window. So. One of, one of the few things left is that almost all of us accept that if you have a choice, you ought not to be deliberately hateful. Hence, they throw around, hey, I guess you could also cash it out, I suppose, that maybe one of the other currencies still left is this idea that safety matters. I mean, for me personally, I hate the level of safetyism, <laughs> but uh, there certainly seems to be a Work shared- Workplace health and safety is safety the first is agenda everywhere. item. Do you have that as a standing order at the University of Queensland? We have that at the University of Sydney. I lived in New Zealand for 11 years. When they were fixing the road, there'd be two orange cones and 12 guys fixing the road. I moved to Australia, there's <laughs> guys directing traffic and maybe one guy fixing the road if you're lucky. I, I just am stunned by the level of health and safety mania here. It played yeah. COVID, by the way. James, if you think those are guys directing traffic in Australia, you also have problems with the definition of woman. Uh, but I'm interested to hear you say that the only remaining consensus in society is what I may take as the, the Bill and Ted principle of be excellent to each other, uh, that it's just, uh, you know, don't hate. And don't hate. That's pretty much. Uh, and, and then hence, once you go down that road, uh, a very you know, tactical weapon is just to say you're being hate, you're a hater and never responding to arguments. It's not, of course, that anyone actually hasn't necessarily been hateful. They just throw the term around to, to end the argument. And uh, so what, what we saw with the Babylon Bee when they, you know, published a spoof piece on, on one of Joe Biden's, I um, uh, can't remember if Miss Levine was in the Interior, I can't remember what the right, Rachel Levine is in the public health service and she's a public senior health service. speaker in the public health service. Yeah. And so, you know, if you have any criticisms at all, you're just a hater. And they're trying to foreclose argument, foreclose discussion. So it's not, you can't play that game. You just, you just have to stand up to it, in my view. But what does that mean to stand up to it? I mean, Babylon B stood up for it. So to, to refresh everyone's memory, Babylon B ran a, uh, they, they put out a meme on Twitter saying, calling Rachel Levine the man of the year. Rachel Levine is a trans man, uh, who, a transsexual who was uh, at, at birth identified or, or, or uh, as a, as a man, but has transitioned to be identifying as female. Uh, that simple headline, man of the year, earned the Babylon B a ban from Twitter. That is, they were told that they could uh, remain on, they were, they were suspended for one day and told they could only remove their suspension if they retracted the tweet, which they refused to do. Twitter characterized this satire as hate speech. I mean, but James, uh, you're a lawyer. Isn't it possible that satire can be hate speech? Uh, well, firstly, you didn't quite give enough background, I don't think. Uh, Levine was born a man, and he remained a man till the age of 54, wife, kids. Uh, when he transitioned, uh, in, it was the USA Today, big newspaper in the US, terrible newspaper, but, you know, reports to be national. They uh, announced a list of their women of the year, and they made uh, Miss Levine one of their, you know, women of the year, and it was in the... In, in that context that the Babylon Bee responded with making him the man of the year. So, you know, it was satire on 
directed really at the USA Today for being so woke and um, so touchy-feely that they would make a pretty insignificant nobody who just happens to have transitioned to a woman, they're women of the year. Surely there are hundreds of women more qualified for women of the year than this guy uh, or this woman or whatever you want to call it. And it was in that context that uh, Babylon B sent out their tweet. And then, of course, they also it led to other people being canceled. Charlie Kirk said, but he was a he was a man until he was 54. I, that was hateful. And uh, uh, somebody commenting on that, I can't remember, was it Mark Stein or somebody commented and said, everything they said is true. And that was hateful. And so you see that uh, Twitter has become a, a cesspit of, of virtue signaling wokeness. Now, one of the things that may well have come out of this is, um, from what I'm reading, one of the main reasons that uh, Elon Musk has decided to t make a move on Twitter is this Babylon Bee thing. So maybe the virtue signaling censors uh, uh, overstepped the mark so much and so annoyed Elon Musk, who was what, worth $300 billion? I think he's worth about $300 billion US. Right, right. Twitter yeah. is worth about 40 or $50 yeah, billion. He's, he's only spent 1% of his fortune to become the largest single shareholder in Twitter. But I, I want to get back to this and un unpack the hate thing a, a little bit more. Um, so there are two separate questions here. The first is, you know, was it hate speech, which we could we could and maybe should debate. And the second is, even if it is hate speech, should it be banned? Because after all, probably about two thirds of Twitter by volume is hate speech. If it's yeah, so, so you've got you've got the rough and ready usage of hate speech, which usually boils down to anything I don't like. And then you have the more legal notions of hate speech. Um, you know, I'm still incredibly annoyed that after nine years of a coalition government, we still have Section 18C, which is a disgrace. And of course, you can legally define hate speech any way you want. And in this country, we've defined it to include being offended, ridiculous, uh, being humiliated, also ridiculous. I mean, part of the, part of the deal when you live in a vigorous democracy is you, you expect to be criticized and you expect to, some of the people to, to criticize you pretty vigorously. And if, if, if censorship boils down to a subjective feeling of being offended, I mean, the world has really moved in a big direction. It's like bullying. I went to a tough state school in Toronto and bullying meant getting beaten up. If someone called you names, you figured it was a good day. I mean, and you go home and your parents would say, sticks and stones can hurt, break your bones, but names will never hurt you. And well, my dad didn't want to hear even if I got beaten up. He said, well, this, <laughs> but he certainly would have laughed if I'd gone home and said, you know, somebody called me names and I, you know, I feel a little bit now. No, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but I don't know that you do well in life if you paint yourself as a victim and you run around looking for ways to be offended. And so hate speech can be defined any way you want legally. The way we've defined it in Australia is pathetic, sort of similar in Canada. Um, hate, speech is, uh, hate speech, however you define it, is protected in the U.S., of course, um, but only as regards government. And so one of the right. problems is that big tech – has basically gone down this incredibly censorious road. And because they're uh, private actors, um, they're just shutting down the sort of community of speech. And it's very hard to do anything about that. I'm not an out and out libertarian. I don't agree with those people who say it's a private company, they can do whatever they want. I think that's simplistic. Well, we, have trade -off we have trade offs all over the place. Well, we, we call this show On Liberty, and On Liberty is an homage to, uh, of, of course, to John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. And Mill was more concerned with the censorious repression of freedom by society than by the censorious repression of freedom by government. In his view, society was more likely to be censorious and that that's what needed protection so that we needed protection from society more than we needed protection from government. Now, I'm not sure that I agree with him, but in the in Mills's sense, I mean, whether Twitter has a legal obligation to be an open space or not, should it be an open space? Well, a it should, um, it, since it has such a dominant sort of position. And many times in the past, even in the U.S., uh, legislation has been passed to stop private companies from discriminating against. You know, based on race, sex, you could add in, um, you know, political viewpoint, or you could make the First Amendment uh, applicable. 
Uh, and all you'd have to do is open it up to lawsuits in state courts with juries, and that would be the end of your entire big tech corporation. They'd be sued into oblivion. Um, now, you don't necessarily want that, but on the same, you know, you're, you're trading off things. And the idea that a bunch of 23-year-old Silicon Valley people who commute to work from San Francisco should be deciding what people through the whole world can be saying, uh, you, you'd have to start weighing up these uh, trade-offs. It's a well, but as of January 1st, Australia is positively requiring pla tech platforms to censor. Uh, Look, you, you can't get into how bad this coalition government is on free speech. The fact they're doing that is outrageous. Um, it's just so disappointing. They haven't, uh, you know, we have a prime minister who purports not to, not to care about free speech and create a single job. Um, really, this is just laughable. It's, uh, you'd be in despair if you weren't laughing. Um, but I think something's good. Now, all, I think most of us would prefer that the problem be fixed to some extent by having a billionaire step in. And uh, Mr. Musk is nothing if not committed to free speech. And already some of the people who work at Twitter have resigned. Uh, I don't know. He's got 9.2%, you said, but that's the SEC filing, and those are lagging by two to three weeks. So for all we know, he could have 20 percent. We just don't know. I also don't know how it, you know, in Australia, what is it, about 20 to 25 percent? And you have effective control. I don't know in the U.S. He'll be talking to the institutional investors, but everyone knows he's worth 300 billion. So he probably doesn't have to buy that much of the company because people know that he can we, we are a live show, and I do want to push a little further on hate speech, but yep. I do also want to bring in our audience. And we do have a question from Christopher. Uh, Christopher says, is the current idiocy, his word, <laughs> not mine, is the current idiocy a product of our long period of easy affluence? Uh, you know, Maybe the malignant ambitions of a Russia or a China will serve as a wake-up call. Uh, well, gee, I, you know causation so hard to put your finger on always. I mean, you and I both work in universities where the viewpoint diversity is hovering somewhere barely above zero. Um, so we, you and I are used to it where, you know, I've always said there's almost complete freedom of speech on the university campus if you are a progressive virtue signaling person, which means that 99% of people on the university who work at universities have complete freedom of speech. There is nothing they would say that would ever invoke the uh, administration to use the code of conduct against them. The only thing I can think of, if you're on the sort of woke left, you might go too far in criticizing Israel. And right. the university might come in with the code. Of, but that is the only instance I think of. Whereas there's all sorts of things that a, a, a non-woke conservative might say where the university would invoke the code of conduct. So when... You know, someone like French and his French report comes in and reads the code of conduct. This is worthless. These codes of conducts are applied discretionarily by the administration. Well, but arguably, you know, university has a responsibility to get back to the hate issue. A university has more of a responsibility to protect the community. I and mean, we can always say that on Twitter, if you can't take the heat, get off Twitter. But we can't very well say to our students, if you can't take the heat, get out of the university. Well, I'm not sure I totally agree with you. I think when they start putting up trigger warnings that, you know, you're reading some classic and it might throw off your sensibilities a little. The university has no no responsibility to students to cater to their uber sensibilities. You know, you, you go in and read the classics if, to the extent universities still teach these. And the idea of going to university, at least with an arts degree, is that you're you're being you're being fed views you wouldn't otherwise encounter and you're having to think about them. And there's nothing better, especially for a lawyer, trying to make the best argument you can for a position you don't agree with. Now that's almost impossible if you reach the point where as soon as you hear a view you don't agree with, you run out of the room. It's pretty hard. I mean, especially with lawyers, how are you training lawyers when they, they can't bear, and this is the case at Yale, at Harvard, they can't bear to even hear views that, that you know throw them off a little. So well, I might, I might ask you about legal education, because obviously in the United States, uh, we've heard this news from Yale Law School of, uh, of people being academics, holding conferences, being shouted down by radical students. I don't know how much of that happens in Australia, but it strikes me that in uh, teaching the law, you'll inevitably have to raise controversies. After all, 
isn't that what the law is all about? <laughs> Resolving controversies. So how has the, the, the uh, how have hate speech directives and the increased sensitivities and the trigger warnings, how have all that in a practical way affected legal education? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. I think to some extent, other things have been worse. Um, I think I think the pro, you know, a lot of the problem is we just have too many law schools. And by that, I mean, we're turning out more lawyers per capita than the Americans. And if you were being brutally honest, outside of the G8 law schools, Canada has 36, 37 million people, of whom 30 to 31 million would be native English speakers. So more population than Australia in terms of English speakers. And there are 16 law schools, and most of them take in 150 a year. Osgood takes in 500. In Australia, we have 32 or 33 or 34, I don't know, might be up to 36 law schools. Some of them take in thousands every year. It's just a money-spinning degree for the universities. And most of these students will never end up practicing law. Now, you could say it's become the new BA. All of that has knock-on effects. It lowers the standards. Um, a lot of the teachings online, which is worthless. Anyone who's lived through a year, two years of Zoom knows it's basically worthless. I can't believe we're allowed to charge students full tuition for when, we, when we're giving them a product like Zoom. Uh, but, you know, just sort of back to your question, when I went through law school in, you know, 82 to 85, you know, when you did criminal law, nobody did a trigger warning. And back then there were still almost as many girls as boys. When you, you had to spend two weeks learning about rape law, this is pretty confronting stuff when you learn about rape law. Right. Uh, Nowadays, you must have two weeks of getting people ready for the fact that you're going to now learn about how the laws on rape work because, you know, you, who knows their sensibilities. Back then it was, well, this is, you know, you're here to learn the facts and how it works. And so I, I think you do, certainly you wouldn't want your own kids to be, we told our own kids, you know, you've got to be robust. I don't want to hear any complaints about stuff like that. And to, to some extent, I suppose the problem is largely the parents. The parents are, you know, in unwittingly raising little snowflakes and you're not doing your kids any favors in my view sticking with the law the the u.s supreme court nominee uh katanji katanji brown jackson nominated by joe biden to fill uh the empty slot on the u.s supreme court uh she famously or infamously declined to offer a definition of the term woman now we, we all know why she declined it she declined it to avoid accusations of transphobia and to avoid getting pulled into these c current uh cultural debates you know the culture wars debates over trans issues but <coughs> is that appropriate do you think or let me ask more broadly do you have any views on uh katanji brown jackson well two three things firstly the senator who asked the question missed a great chance to follow up and nail her because she went on to say because i'm not a biologist at which point he should have said so you accept that the question of whether someone's a male or female is a biological question and i would have loved to have seen how she responded to that uh, look there's a very famous legal philosopher hla hart wrote one book in his life it sold about half a million copies so far this is legal philosophy, so there's no one near. And one of, he has many great insights. Uh, I, I was, you know, I'm a bit like Bentham when he read Hume. He said the scales fell from my eyes. I felt like that when I read Hart. Just about everyone does. And uh, one of one of Hart's thing insights is that when you send a legal rule out into the world, there are core cases where it's obvious to everyone that the rule applies. And no matter how detailed the rule is, even if it's like a tax code with 8,000 pages, at some point the rule will hit a set of facts where the fact, where the truth just is that nobody knows. There's equally strong arguments for saying the rule applies and it doesn't apply. And that insight works on everything. So of course, if someone says, do you know what a woman is? Anyone with a brain in the core, which is 99.999% of the time, can point to two X chromosomes, they can point to reproductive organs. It's obvious who's a woman. They can point to the fact that they, you know, lose sporting events, the X, Y chromosome, it doesn't matter. You send that example out into the world and at the far, far periphery, you're going to run up against people with X, X, Y chromosomes. Or there's a number of genetic conditions where, uh, these are natural genetic conditions where, you know, the people who are born have both sets of reproductive. And you could say, well, is that a woman? And the honest answer is, don't know. And you could that also to uh, people who transition at the far periphery you know in those cases 
And then you might say, well, it, it matters in those cases what we're talking about. Are we talking about sporting events? Because when we're talking about sporting events, the answer I think should be not a woman. Because if you go through male puberty and you have that sort of 20 years of testosterone coursing through your body, going through male puberty is like an illegal drug. You are going to beat women at everything. And so well, instance, as you say, not a woman. If it's something where, you know, there's no real competitive aspect to it or there's no reason why, then, and someone wants to be classed as a woman, then I don't see why they shouldn't be. But, you know, so she knew as well as I did, Miss Jackson, who's a woman. And if you get out into the far reaches of examples at the periphery, then it's clear that there'll be some reasonable disagreement depending on the circumstances. Yeah. Well, focusing talking about. But focusing on our approach to the question instead of on the trans issue specifically, uh, you know, one of the most uh, evocative responses to that was a, a, a blogger who, uh, in a separate setting, but it's who'd been confronted with that. How do you know? How can you identify a woman? Are you a biologist? And she said, I I'm not a veterinarian, but I know what a dog is. Sure. Um, and they're talking and, about the 99.999% of time. Where it's and, obvious. And so let me take this out of the, the trans world and put this, you make this the, the broader debate. I, I mean, do we need to do, do judicial candidates, do you know, people who are potentially going to be appointed as judges or people adjudicating the law, do, do they have to necessarily always rely on an expert opinion or do, does our, do our broader views as a society matter? I mean, how much do you need a biologist or a psychiatrist or a gender studies expert to define masculinity? How much do you need a veterinarian to define what an animal is? Or well, it's, a, it's an unusual circumstance. Because, you know, I think it's unusual because only in the U.S. are judicial nominees uh, thrown up against a legislative body, the Senate, and they don't get the job if they don't get confirmed by the Senate. Now, right be against that system, to be honest, because I, I think that the way we're picking judges in Australia, and I say this as a right of center, sort of atheist conservative view, I mean, I think Labour did a better job of appointing judges that I like than the last nine years of uh, coalition government. We have a coalition government whose idea of appointing judges is to look for the, the candidate who resigned and appoint his wife, or find the daughter of a former high court judge. This is a ridiculous, they have made... You know, it's, I'm not clear what their what their criteria are for appointing justices the the um, coalition. But going back to the U.S. in that context, when you're faced with um, having to answer questions in order to get confirmed, of course politics is all over it. And you're right; she didn't want to answer because if she answered in a sensible way, she would uh, she would lose the support of a lot of sort of hard left. Um, gender activists, transgender activists, and she couldn't afford that. So she made the right answer in terms of wanting to get confirmed. And it's a very politicized system in the U.S., and you get some weird anomalies, like uh, such as, um, you know, some of the Republican senators who weren't prepared to vote for Amy Barrett are prepared to vote for Kenji Jackson. And you, when you start seeing things like that, you, it's not, you know, you can see why the Republican Party is at war with itself. Right. Romney didn't vote for Kenji Jackson to get onto the federal court. He said she wasn't qualified to get on the federal court. But now that she's going to the Supreme Court, he's just announced he's going to vote for her. So I don't know how you can vote for someone for the circuit court. And then when she's going to be promoted, maybe, say, maybe she, she's oh, sorry, he voted against her and now he's voting for her. Maybe she's done a really great job. <laughs> Let me give a, a, a couple shout outs to Anthony, to Jean. Uh, and I want to go back to a question from Christopher. Christopher asks in regard to the Twitter issue, could the common carrier doctrine be applied against the abuses of power by big tech companies? Should they just be converted into common carriers? Yeah, that's one of the, there's a number of fixes that have been suggested and that's one of the good ones. So when you got a phone, back when everyone had landlines, so for any of your young people, they'll have to go and learn that people used to have phones that didn't move around with them and they were connected to the, to the wall. And, well, back when you had those phone companies, uh, the phone companies were subject to common carrier legislation. All that meant was that, you know, Bell Telephone or whatever other telephone company there was, they couldn't turn your, they couldn't refuse you a phone because they didn't like your politics, right? So it didn't matter what you said, you got a phone. And that was a private company. 
And so the analogy that is being suggested is, well, today's big tech is a lot like phone companies. The, the whole um, sort of town square discussion operates through Twitter. This is the argument. I don't actually agree with that. I think Twitter represents a, you know, the farthest left sort of point of view. But the analogy is not a bad one. And so why can't they just uh, pass common carrier type legislation saying that you, know, you cannot shut off views you know, up to and including, you know, First Amendment, you can't incite violence, that sort of thing, fine. Well, but I can incite violence over the phone, right? I mean, if I call you, I can, in our private conversation, sure. yeah. say all sorts of illegal things uh, because yeah. it's a common carrier. They're not monitoring what I say. Yeah, but that's true. Twitter or a Facebook, we do expect them to moderate. So doesn't it make it impossible for them to be a common carrier? Yeah, we expect them to moderate, but not very much because, you know, in, in helping the whole big tech industry grow up, they passed legislation so that it was treated as a platform, not a publisher. If, if, if all of the technology companies were treated as publishers, they'd have been sued into bankruptcy a long time ago. Even in the U.S. where you have the public figure defense, they still would have been sued into. So they, they only operate because of legislation that treats them differently than, you know, the Australian newspaper. All the big publishers, the old publishers, the pre-big tech, they spend a fortune on lawyers to vet what they were, what they can actually run. And big tech exempted from all of that. It's not God that exempted them. It's, you know, the U.S. Congress that exempted them. Mm. And so in a world where we have given them all of these advantages on the premise that they are going to be a platform and not a sort of propaganda arm of, of the Democratic Party, have any problem with stepping in with legislation. Now, whether common carrier is the best way, I don't know. You could pass legislation that extends no discrimination from you know, race, sex, and just include political viewpoints. Now, you and I laugh sometimes, Salvatore, because universities are full of all the diversity talk. You know, the, the most important thing in the world is diversity. But what's diversity? <laughs> all the diversity, except, except viewpoint diversity, yes, right? Uh, no, which the is viewpoint diversity is hovering around zero. Which is where we want to wrap up. We do have to get going in a minute, but I do have one final question for you, which is accepting that there is a, a serious, uh, I mean, a very serious viewpoint diversity problem. We might even say crisis, not only at universities, but universities and in the upper reaches of the corporate world, in the legal profession, in the medical profession, uh, given that we have a, this problem, what can we do about it? What what can we do to, to solve it? Yeah, hard question, especially the universities. I think once you've captured, and I agree with Mark Stein that everything is downstream of culture. Um, you know, Mr. Morrison seems to think that culture doesn't matter at all, and. It just seems like a slow motion suicide note if you're a right of center political party. Everything is downloaded downstream of culture. So if you have 36 law schools overwhelmingly teaching woke left sort of points of view, it's not a giant surprise that today's legal uh, fraternity, today's uh, cast of legal experts, if you pick the median lawyer today, it's they're far to the left of the median voter. When I was growing up, you know, lawyers were conservative. The median lawyer would have been to the right of the median voter. And it's now infecting big companies. They were the last thing left. And so how do you fix it? It's hard. Uh, you, I was just reading an essay this morning about uh, the, yesterday's election in Hungary or two days ago's election in Hungary. And one of the things Orban has done is he set out to create competing cultural institutions, in, you know, universities that aren't just woke left universities, so new ones. And he's funded new cultural people, so not just one's on the left. And of course, the status quo people hate this. But one of the funniest things I read were these Americans saying he's getting his friends to buy media companies so that they promote his point of view. And, and you know, the, the point of view at the election, there was an, you know, a majority of the outlets were in favor of Orban. And I thought, this American journalist has no self-awareness at all. When you look at the American media and you see how they donate, you know, during Trump's time, it was like, I don't know, 15, 20 to 1. It's public information in the states. Donate Democrat. You know, at one point, they ran a study that showed that Trump got worse coverage than than Kim, the, the leader in North Korea, and the mullahs. You know, 
I would take, if you were on the losing side, you would take the coverage in Hungary any day over the coverage you get as a Republican in the U.S. You have no self-awareness if you think the mainstream media in the U.S. You can count on one hand the, the outlets that aren't straight left, and one is the Wall Street Journal and the other is the New York Post. And then you don't have any more fingers left on your hands that you'll need to use. And so this is a real problem. And, you know, Orban's fighting back and he's fighting back hard and we might not like all of the routes he's taking, but it turns out that a lot of people are sympathetic to that. And maybe we should at least start electing people who have a little bit of fight in them who want to try things. Every cultural institution is worse today than it was in 2013. And that's nine years of coalition government the universities are worse. I think the high court is worse. I think um, corporations are worse, certainly. you know. So, and I'm, and we can get into other things, the debt, but that's not really cultural, but debt is worse or higher taxing. Right down the line, and you think, well, we're not electing the right kind of people. <laughs> What's going on here? That's my view. Or, or, or maybe we're just older than we were nine years ago, <laughs> Professor Jim. I'm definitely older, but what you don't know, Salvatore, is if my mom could have held on for 15 minutes, I would be 15 years old. Uh, that's, well, a, that's a puzzle you can work out. But my, <laughs> if I'd been born 15 minutes later, I'd be 15 years yeah, old. Yeah, I, I got it. I got it. I got it. Professor, <laughs> Professor James Allen, thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. And thank you. And I keep doing the good work. And let me recommend to all the other people listening, Salvatore's great interview with John Anderson. It was a phenomenal interview. You guys should listen to that. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Uh, thanks also to our producer, Nico Malian. The director of the Center for Independent Studies is Tom Switzer. I'm Salvatore Babonis. Thank you for watching On Liberty.